Welcome back. Dr. Justin Frank is with us, professor of psychiatry at uh, George Washington University, clinical professor and psychoanalyst, uh, MD, Dr. Frank, uh, Dustin Frank, MD. Dr. Frank, we, you know, we were talking about um, this, uh, uh, the, the idea of authoritarianism and people wanting leaders and how, you know, kind of deep down inside we're all still little kids, I suppose, or that, that little child is still within us all. You look at these uh, so-called great men who have dominated hi hi history, Hitler, Mussolini, Napoleon, um, and so on. And, you know, I, I, over the years, I, I recall reading these debates about whether the great man theory of history is real or whether these people simply emerged out of a time that was definitely going to produce someone like them. And it was the circumstances, not the personality. And that, that leads me to wonder, you know, did Donald Trump step into a space that was already open or is there something unique about his personality that makes him a particular danger to democracy in the United States? Would a, would a Tom Cotton or a, a Josh Hawley, or I'm guessing you don't want to get so specific, but would another Republican who maybe shares the same views be nowhere near as dangerous because they have a different personality? To what extent are these so-called great men and women um, uh, you know, unique in their positions and their power because of their personalities versus the circumstances that put them there? Well, um, what about comparing Donald Trump to Tony Soprano? Okay. And what about talking about the yearning for a mob boss to make other people feel safe? Well, you could also Tony argue that, that, that Tony Soprano got where he was, were he a real character, um, by being, you know, a tough guy, a bully, by, by having a personality that was sort of like Donald Trump, that was, you know, willing yeah, to just ride roughshod over others. That's what I'm saying. Uh huh. I'm saying that Trump is like Tony Soprano and is like a mob boss who uh, can make you feel protected if you're on his side and will destroy anything that gets in his way and will find a different way to destroy them. What makes Donald Par uh, Trump different from Tony Soprano is that Donald, although Tony Soprano is a fictional character, uh, Tony Soprano seems to actually love his own family. And I don't think Donald Trump loves anybody particularly. I think that Donald Trump is a, is a fundamentally person who's hell-bent on being destructive. He loves destruction. He loves breaking things. He uh, promised infrastructure for four years and then never uh, delivered. And then as soon as Biden delivers, um, Trump attacks it because he hates structure because structure is limiting. Mm -hmm. And as a great, powerful man stepping into the government, he hates the structure of Congress. He hated the structure of the press. He made them into the enemy. He made laws into the enemy. He talked about losers who were buried uh, in, in wars, who fought for America because they were killed. McCain was a loser. So he really breaks things down. So I don't think that uh, as a strong man, uh, he did step into a vacuum in a way. I think that Obama left a vacuum because people were yearning for a strong leader and obama was not a strong leader um, and in my book about obama i did write that he suffered from obsessional bipartisan disorder that he felt people just had to get along no matter what and he would immediately become friends with bob dole and different right-wing people rather than uh, the people who got him elected hmm. And, and he has stayed that way. So he was not a strong leader. And so people were looking for somebody who's strong. And I have to say, in Trump's uh, own way, he was a very strong person. But he was not a visionary person. The great man theory that you're talking about, you did leave out Roosevelt, who I think was a great man. Mm -hmm. At least uh, that's the only American. And Martin Luther King, but he never became president. Usually the great men in America get assassinated. Like Lincoln. Uh, yeah. Great leaders like Lincoln, like uh, like Martin Luther King, 
But I thought you played something very important in one of your breaks earlier that I was listening to was about you. Was that a Jimmy Carter quote? Yeah, I can I can I'm play talking. it right now if you'd like because most people well, didn't, didn't hear that break. Well, most people didn't hear no, it. No, no, oh. that that only plays on our nonprofit radio station. So, so would you play it? Right I would. Now? This yeah. this is okay. from this is from uh, nineteen. Let's see. This is the the last year. Or yeah, yeah. No, I think it's it's seventy nine. I think it's the last the, the last yeah. maybe even early nineteen eighty. Jimmy Carter has uh, proposed some serious legislation here, and uh, he you know put up the solar panels yeah. on the roof of the White House. And here here is what he has to say. It's in two parts. The energy crisis is real. It is worldwide. It is a clear and present danger to our nation. These are facts and we simply must face them. What I have to say to you now about energy is simple and vitally important. Point one, I am tonight setting a clear goal for the energy policy of the United States. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977, never. And then he goes on to talk about solar power, which is Moreover, right I will here. soon submit legislation to Congress calling for the creation of this nation's first solar bank, which will help us achieve the crucial goal of 20% of our energy coming from solar power by the year 2000. It's heartbreaking, Okay, isn't it? I have a lot. Can I say some thoughts about this? Please. <clears throat> okay, first of all, that is a visionary leader. Yes. If he were allowed to be a great man, and I think he had it in him, Jimmy Carter could have been a great man, but he was attacked by the press because he was a thinking man, and he paid attention to uh, telling us to do things that involved sacrifice. So he would wear a sweater in the White House rather than turn up the heat, and that upset a lot of people. What's wrong with a president wearing a sweater? This is terrible leadership. This is not a strong man. This is not an authority figure. He's a person who is uh, forcing us to think and face reality. And this circles full round to the beginning of our discussion today, which is the hatred of learning, the hatred of education, the attack on thinking, the attack on linking. And all of us unconsciously, not only do we have yearnings for an authority, we have another problem unconsciously, which is that we're very attracted to non-thought. It's much easier to not have to do the work of thinking, so to leave things in terms of either or, and just have absolutes so we don't have to think. And that's where the yearning for an authoritarian figure is about, because democracy is, is a noun. It's not a verb. It's something that we have to think about and protect and work towards protecting. And since the beginning of uh, Trump's presidency, we've had a full-fledged attack on democracy. And to fight for democracy involves conceptually, conceptualizing that fight as a marathon and not a sprint. That this is a long process that has to be addressed directly and clearly, which I think is what you're doing on your show. What Jimmy Carter did was, the term he used really got to me, hearing it a second time, I want to put up a solar bank. The idea of a bank involves savings. The idea of a bank involves combating debt. He's saying we're not going to rely on foreign oil uh, that was greater than in 1977. So he's aware of the debt. And what the Republicans do is they complain about government spending and they complain about the debt, but actually they're the ones who always have the debt and then Clinton comes to office and gets rid of the debt or Obama comes to office and gets rid of the debt, both for the most part. <clears throat> and then they increase the debt under Trump with the tax breaks, et cetera. Everybody knows those stories. But there's another kind of debt that the Republicans don't give a damn about, pardon my French, and that's the debt that is climate debt. That every time we drill, every time we take things from the earth, we are creating a new situation of future debt. 
So my children and grandchildren and yours and theirs are going to have to pay for that debt. And God knows what it's going to be like in terms of the future and global warming. But they're going to have to pay for it. Carter understood that. So he could have been a great leader. But that brings me to the second point that we were talking about before about Youngkin and the campaigns and the candidates. And that is that it is true about about racism and some of these things, but it's also true that you can't really have a great leader without a free press. Hmm. And what we have had now is uh, not just not a free press, but we've had a press that is free to lie and not have uh, any breaks or corrections on it. Uh, there used to be a State of the Union, and then you'd make a anti-State of the Union or whatever it was. But what Fox is doing is they run like Pravda. They're the Pravda of America. And they have they tell you what's true and what isn't, and that's it. And that's very dangerous. You can never have a true democracy with Fox News. I'm sorry. And I don't know how to deal with that, but that's a fact in my mind. That's a, a serious fact. And when they talk about fair and balanced, that means that if you think the moon is made out of green cheese, you get equal time to a person who says the moon is made of minerals. Yeah. That's what fair and balanced means to Fox News. You know, over in, uh, in Australia, Kevin Rudd, the former prime minister of Australia, mm -hmm. wrote an op-ed for the Sydney Morning Herald uh, two years ago titled, Rupert Murdoch is the cancer at the heart of Australian democracy. And then he goes on to point yes. out uh, UK democracy and American democracy as, as well. It's really a thought-provoking piece. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Justin Frank, psychoanalyst and clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry at George Washington University, author of Trump on the Couch, among other books. You can follow him on Twitter at Justin Frank MD, spelled just like it sounds. And welcome back. So, Dr. Frank, we've, we've talked about you know, the, 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 the dark side of great men, or the bad side of great men. Um, you know, the, 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 the Hitler, um, Trump, uh, as opposed to the Carter, FDR builders. Um, how do we as a society, and, and perhaps more consequentially, how do we individually um, do uh, both societal and political battle with such people and the forces that they bring with them and also how do we prevent that from destroying us internally well it's there i wish i could answer that or we could answer that together but i think it's an ongoing process there is not one sudden answer but the main answer for me right now and this is at the beginning phase is the concept of relentlessness that we have to relentlessly fight for human freedom, for freedom of speech, for democracy, and against certain kinds of corporate greed and destructiveness, et cetera, et cetera, and against racism. But you can only be relentless if there's a ray of hope. Otherwise, you give up. And one of the things that's really important, I would like to address at least uh, one aspect of it, which is that we are very much dominated, all of us, including from children, really, is an all-or-none philosophy. And that if we think about all-or-none, we end up with despair. Because if we're not enough, we are nothing. And that's just not good. And so I think when you say, how do we fight against all of this? The first way is to not think in terms of all or nothing, because we, one of us or you and me alone and all the people who are listening can't be enough, but we can be part of a process that's an ongoing battle. And part of the ongoing battle involves doing something really old fashioned, maybe like we did during the Vietnam War of having teach ins, of having groups of people talking like you and I are talking and have groups of people talking and questioning and discussing what's going on in the world. We have uh, to talk about the fact that everybody, the people who are on Trump's side, feel robbed. We're feeling robbed of Biden and robbed of our democracy, 
by these by the January 6th, but the people who attacked the Capitol feel robbed by the electoral system, which is not true. But as long as Fox News exists and Rupert Murdoch, it's going to be seen as true. And so we're going to be constantly in a different kind of battle from something that's shared as Americans, where we have different points of view. We're now having a battle about what's real and what isn't, and what's true and what isn't. And that reminds me of my work on the psychotic, with psychotic patients. And one of the ways to work with psychotic people, and I hate to call the Republicans psychotic, but in some ways they are, because they're out of touch with reality. <clears throat> they don't accept the fact that Biden won the election. That's psychotic to me. The way you deal with them is that you have to listen to them. And you have to say, I can really see what you're talking about. But you have to work with them. But you have to confront them. And we have to document every day, like what you do in your program, we have to document examples of the erosion of democracy and of the good things. So we have a record of what's been going on individually. Dr. Justin Frank, author of uh, Trump on the Couch and others. And uh, uh, Dr. Frank, uh, we're, you know, we were talking about defending ourselves against these kind of crazed personalities. and. And, and, and as a society as well, and then, and then wandered into discussing um, right-wing media. I'm wondering how, in your mind, we should best deal with the kind of crisis that could happen uh, next year or in 2024, more likely, if either Republicans lose, uh, yeah, this could be local races, statewide races, or even federally, and refuse to acknowledge that loss and try to b basically bring the system down around us, or if uh, Republicans seize power, if, if, for example, you know, the 1876 scenario where um, you get several states, uh, let's say, you know, Wisconsin, Texas, Florida, Georgia, that submit multiple ballots, multiple elector slates, and as a result, there's not a clear winner. So it, the election gets thrown into the House, 30 states are controlled by Republicans, the House says, okay, Donald Trump is president in 2024, even though he lost the electoral vote and he lost the popular vote. How do we deal with that? By the way, we have about a, a two minutes, I think. Oh, well, sure, I can solve this one in two minutes. <laughs> You're right. Thank you for having me. Don't you think we should be stealing ourselves right now, though? I mean, we should be talking yeah. about this? Well, let's start with a couple of basic things. I think we talked about it already, about what to do, which is about teach-ins and connection and people getting together. And we have to have groups that are organized and that work together. I don't know who's going to call them uh, to and organize it. And there will be organizers, hopefully, that will step up and do it. I do think that there's a group of people now who are very interested in the concept of a declaration of interdependence and not just a declaration of independence. And we need to face the fact that we are interdependent. And not just uh, right now, people have been trying to talk about it globally, and of course, that doesn't work. But in this country, we have to remember that we're interdependent. And that when you have bad water in Flint, Michigan, that's going to affect some wealthy person in Telluride. I just think it will. And I don't think it is uh, seen as an immediate thing. But if there's interdependent, uh, understanding, I think that we will begin uh, to face that kind of problem. And it has to be uh, together. Mm -hmm. The power is that what Freud wrote about, my first mentor, uh, not that I ever knew him, but um, he said that the rule of law, which is what America is about, is always a problem because it interferes with the feeling of wanting to be free to do whatever you want. Okay. And therefore, the, the rule of law limits people. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can people see that the rule of law can help people grow? That doing certain things like doing your homework will help you succeed in later in life, or doing certain things where the parents set down rules, or rules of respect, or rules of being able to listen to other people. All of those things can help in growth and development. And as Harry Truman said, 
If you want to think like, if you want to live like a Republican, vote Democratic. <laughs> there you go. Dr. Justin Frank, you can follow him on Twitter, Justin Frank MD, his most recent book, uh, Trump on the Couch. Dr. Frank, thanks so much for dropping by today. Great talking with you. Thank you, Tom. Always great talking with you. Thanks so much for being with us today. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. In the meantime, don't forget democracy is not a spectator sport. It does require all of us. That includes you. So get out there, get active, join up with them. There's some great groups out there doing great work. Tag, you're it. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great afternoon. Be good to yourself and the people around you.